Hello, everyone, and welcome to Collaborative Drug Discovery Scientific Webinar on Protax, Developing New Therapies Through Targeted Protein Degradation. Traditional drug discovery pipelines have focused on finding small molecules that inhibit protein activity to rebalance a disease state. This focus on protein inhibition has limited drug discovery potential based on the ability of proteins to be targeted and which sites can lead to inhibition. Degraders offer a new avenue for targeting disease states and expanding what diseases are druggable. Degraders take advantage of the nat natural machinery of the cell to degrade proteins instead of simply inhibiting their activity. Researchers, such as our great panel today, are using degraders to look beyond the active sites of proteins and expand their toolkit for drugging diseases. Today, with our expert panelists, we will discuss the world of protax and degrader-based therapies, where they currently stand, and how they may change the landscape of druggable diseases in the future. For those of you who are new to collaborative drug discovery, we are a software company that has been driving innovation in scientific informatics since 2004. Our flagship product, CDD Vault, provides a cloud-based secure solution for data management and is trusted globally by thousands of leading researchers. Founded by scientists, we strive for innovation and bring together experts every quarter for dynamic webinars, such as the one today. I am Robert Thorne, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am pleased to introduce today's expert panelists, and I encourage you to read more about their accomplishments on the CDD blog. We have Stuart Fisher, CSO at C4 Therapeutics, Eric Fisher, Assistant Professor at the Harvard University Medical School, and Nathaniel Gray, Professor at the Harvard University Medical School. Before we jump into the conversation today, I want to let our audience know that if at any time during today's webinar, you'd like to ask the panelists a question, feel free to use Zoom's Q&A panel. We'll be sure to save time at the end to answer audience questions. Uh, now, thanks again, panelists, for being here. Today, we will be discussing Protax and the future of these degrader-based therapies. So I do want to begin by hearing from you all about what a Protax or bivalent degrader is and what the important components of these molecules are. Um, and we can start with you, Nathaniel. Yeah, so, you know, classically, a Protax is a bivalent compound that has a ligand that targets a protein of interest. It has some sort of a uh, linkage segment, and then it has a, another moiety that recruits the E3 uh, ligase uh, to the target. And so, you know, one of the attractive features of a classical uh, protac molecule is it has a very modular uh, design nature uh, to make the initial uh, compound. Okay. Uh, Stu or Eric, anything else you want to add? Sure, I'd say, you know, I think the key for this is, and it's in the, in the term here, it's really around that degradation function. While these molecules can have inhibitory components as part of their um, binding moieties to the target protein and to the E3 ligase on the other side, it's really the fact that they bring these, you know, proteins in close proximity and then that turns over that target protein. So it's really the degradation is the end result that we focus on and it's really about in, when thinking about this, it's really designing uh, molecules that enhance that, um, that interaction and, and, and allow that processing. Okay, and, and I would add to this that maybe a little bit provocative, but at a fundamental level, it doesn't really matter what the protag looks like from a chemistry point of view. It really has to induce degradation. At this point, they may look like bifunctional small molecules, but that may be different in five to 10 years. And, and what we're really trying to achieve is pharmacology driven by degradation of, of a target protein. Yeah, great. Um, Eric, that brings up a good point. So uh, people may have heard of small molecule degraders such as the image, these molecular glues. How are protax different from those or, or are they different at all? Uh, do you wanna start, Eric? I can, I can start. I think, again, from, especially for me, thinking about this more from a protein structural biology point of view, there are some inherent differences, the biggest certainly being that the proteins as they are right now have distinct binding moieties for the target and, and the ligase, but in the end, they really serve the same purpose of dimerizing two proteins or a protein complex and a target complex. And 
as technology evolves, the molecules really very much converge to, to, to the same space. And Protax often in the course of development become smaller. Um, glues may at some point become bigger. I, I, I tend to not make too much distinction, but from a design principle, there are certainly differences. I think maybe just to add to that, I mean, is, is it, you know, a bit two historical strands, you know, coming together. So, you know, the images were uh, discovered uh, serendipitously and, you know, used clinically for many years in the absence of understanding their mechanism of action. And only through recent studies have we understood that they, you know, work as, as degraders. Whereas, you know, Protax came from a, a parallel line of investigation to try to design this modality uh, artificially. But as Eric said, in the end of the day, you know, you want a molecule that acts as a catalyst for uh, destruction. And whether you get it from rational design or through a phenotypic screen, uh, you know, the end result is the same. Um, but there are some, you know, I think some salient, you know, differences. And one is that with Protax, people are inherently drawn to work on targets where there are already known ligands, which biases you towards places where chemists have already, you know, worked. Whereas, you know, the IMIDs uh, and some of the targets that they degrade uh, before IMIDs, they weren't really considered to be targets. So, you know, zinc finger transcription factors, IKZF1, 3, uh, these weren't, you know, thought necessarily to be targets because they were uh, undruggable. And so I think one conceptual difference is that if you work on sort of more the IMID type mechanism, you may end up working on, you know, less characterized uh, targets, things that wouldn't conventionally be drugged. Whereas if you're sort of in the protac paradigm, you know, you might be working more likely from known uh, chemical matter. And doesn't mean those molecules won't have differentiated uh, pharmacology, uh, but it sort of biases you towards a sort of previously drugged ligand space. Yeah, and I'll just add a very, you know, to this conversation, a very similar train of thought. I think it really does um, come down to the fact that the endpoint in both cases of this is that degradation of the target protein. And um, let's face it, the, the, the ultimate um, beneficiaries of these strategies are going to be patients, and they won't care or know um, about what's the specifics. Now, it does make a huge difference, as Nathaniel just highlighted, um, in terms of how you discover these and how you develop them. But again, I think that there's a, a, a back to Eric's point, uh, I think bifunctional degraders tend to get smaller. Glues could get bigger. It's really around making sure that you have the right physical properties and molecular properties to make these into drugs. And while you may say that smaller molecules are better, um, I think there's examples, plenty in the literature now, that um, you know molecules of, of either shape and size can progress into the clinic and, uh, and be functional. So I think while there's um, differences between these two uh, at the molecular level, uh, the, the end result may, remains the same, that you are actually targeting proteins in a fundamentally different way, and that the process to get to drugs is, is also uh, fundamentally very similar between the two strategies. Awesome. Yeah, so thinking about the degradation more, too, um, it, it seems that we need something to degrade these molecules, or we know that we need these something uh, to degrade it. And we have these E3 ligases that ubiquitinate a protein for degradation, degradation but what does ubiquitination do in normal healthy cells and why is it useful to use this uh, already um, already uh, used machinery from the cell? I, I mean, the, the, as the name implies, it does everything. Ubiquitin <laughs> is literally in every single process in a cell and you can find it whatever you look at. Um, it's also worth by knowing that ubiquitin not only is a mediator of protein degradation, but also serves a lot of regulatory functions, shapes protein-protein complexes, serves as a, as a um, histone mark, and so on and so forth. The reason it's important for what we're trying to do here is because it is the primary signal for directed controlled protein degradation, where polyubiquitin chains get attached to the target and trigger a process that ultimately delivers the protein that's tagged with ubiquitin to the proteasome to be chopped up in small peptides. Yeah, I think just to add to that, um, you know, classically, you know, large, you know, bivalent compounds like, like Protax ha have had, you know, issues with limited cellular bioavailability and often their cellular concentrations can be 
you know, thousands of times or more, you know, hundreds of thousands of times lower by availability than classical small molecules. And so really you're taking advantage of this, you know, highly optimized catalytic machinery already in cells. And all you need the small molecule to do is get the right geometry uh, set up for that, you know, reaction. So if you weren't exploiting that pre-existing mechanism, uh, you know, it would be, you know, really uh, challenging. And so you're, you're taking advantage of the catalytic power that's already there and circumventing that or reprogramming that with a, uh, with a small molecule. And that what, that's what sort of underlies this, you know, the power in this strategy. And well-designed degraders can often have, you know, almost immeasurable, you know, binding affinities to the two uh, components. But because uh, they establish, you know, a very efficient catalytic complex, uh, you can get ubiquitilation and, and, uh, and degradation. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the most exciting things, I mean, th this is a, a tremendously exciting field in large measure because we're leveraging nature to do brand new pharmacology, which frankly, nature has mastered uh, throughout all of evolution. Um, but we're now we're able to leverage it in a, in a you know, fundamentally um, new way from a drug discovery point of view. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's really a new plank that is fundamentally distinct and um, will have its own unique properties and benefits relative to other well-known strategies for uh, drug discovery, antibodies, nucleic acid approaches, and classical inhibitors. It's fundamentally different, but it's leveraging nature's own machinery um, to drive a, a new uh, drug endpoint. So I think that is, it's well-founded in, in, so it's not a space age technology in that it's, um, it's untested in terms of cellular processes. It's actually just leveraging nature to do brand new things. And I, I find that to really level set um, target space in a new way and bring in new pharmacology in ways that were impossible before. So it's, I find it uh, just tremendously fascinating. Awesome. So thinking about traditional pharmacology and this focus on inhibition in the past, um, what are some of the limitations of that current paradigm of inhibition and how can the this degrader based approach um, improve upon that or kind of fill in some of those limitations? Yeah, maybe I can start. So I think there are really two inherent and fundamental limitations to inhibitors. One is you need sufficient occupancy of your target to drive your pharmacology. And depending on what the target is and what the biology is, this can be well above 90% occupancy, which can be hard to achieve on a sustained basis. And the second, as the name implies, there needs to be a function that can be inhibited. So there needs to be either an enzymatic function or protein-protein interaction, something that you can actually inhibit. And the combination of the two in the end defines the limited space you can operate in, while in contrast with thinking about degradation, in theory, anything that can be regulated by protein abundance could be, could be regulated by this approach. Yes. Stu or Nate, anything to add on that? You know, I think I think that's a great you know it's a great summary. I mean, yeah. um, you know, traditional targets, you know, either you know substrate based ligand design or covalent inhibitors or you know high throughput screening, and you're really limited, you know, to targets that have you know good drug like uh, binding sites. And you know, many proteins don't have that. Either they don't have cavities, or a large number of proteins are intrinsically uh, disordered. These may be, you know, much better to target through, uh, you know, through degradation. So I think that's, you know, one, you know, really, you know, really fundamental difference. And then the other fundamental difference is that, you know, when you get rid of the protein through degradation, you may have its strongest influence because of disrupting a complex and not because of that protein, uh, you know, per se. So you have these potential, you know, bystander effects, which can be positive or they could be uh, negative, but it's just a fundamentally different pharmacology than you would expect from a, you know, ligand-based occupancy model. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think that much of, you know, inhibitor optimization has been well-founded in a number of guiding and very strong medicinal chemistry principles, often, you know, encapsulated in things called like rule of five and so forth. I think what we're finding now is by going with this approach, you have to face um, different challenges and go beyond the rule of five. And while there's been some efforts in the past of that type and drugs that are in that class, there hasn't been a lot of effort in a focused way to really build out that beyond a rule of five space. And I think 
these heterobifunctional degraders in, 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 in uh, primarily, but also in larger size glues, you are now actually confronting, because of the power of this approach, can you and how do you develop drugs that are beyond those traditional um, medicinal chemistry rules? And, and uh, it certainly can and is being done. I just think it's expanding our scope and knowledge of medicinal chemistry in a way that uh, is leveraging this technology, but teaching us uh, well beyond just this space. And, and that's what I also find uh, very attractive. Awesome. So uh, thank you for that beginning discussion. We're now going to uh, involve the audience a little bit. Uh, and we'd like to ask the audience a question. And for that, I will hand it over to Charlie Weatherall, the keeper of the poll. <laughs> Hi, everyone. All right, attendees, here's your chance to, to weigh in a little bit. We're, uh, as a group, really interested in how familiar each of you are with these degrader-based compounds. So uh, please let us know if you're not considering researching these at all, if you're interested in them but not actively using them, or if you are uh, by chance already actively pursuing uh, degrader-based compounds in your research and work today. So good participation here from the audience. So I'll give you a little bit more time to respond to the poll. All right, seems to have slowed down a bit. So I will end the polling now in three, two, one. Boom, thank you, thank you. All right, for the results here, you can see um, uh, pretty much right in the middle, 81% or 55% of you uh, are interested in the technology but not actively using it. So I think that's probably why we have a, a really good interest in today's webinar. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, the panelists have any uh, discussions or thoughts on these numbers, but uh, there they are. A, a good number already using them. So 41% is not, not too bad, uh, too far behind the 55 that are only interested. No, I think it's exciting to see. I mean, you know, the, the technology, you know, is being explored, you know, as a drug discovery strategy, but it's also a very powerful chemical biology strategy for validating and, and, and devalidating uh, targets. So I think it'll have wide applicability um, and there's a lot of methods being put out into the public domain. So I think it, it's going to, you know, be quite commonly used. And also for biologists who don't want to, you know, make molecules, Many of these degrader molecules and degradation tags now are available as kits and from vendors. So the accessibility of the technology, you know, doesn't require you to be a, a chemistry black belt. Yeah, I would agree. I think you know, being in this in this field, you know, actively for the last four plus years, I think it's clear to me by seeing the number of conferences and attending many of them, the level of interest in this field and actual engagement across the industry is growing um, rapidly. And, um, and so it's, this is, these numbers are, are consistent with my own experience interacting with the broader community. And it's, it, it is, as, as uh, Nathaniel says, really exciting to see. I, I think there's tremendous scope and room for this technology. And uh, it's great to see people excited and, and involved. Perfect. All right. Thank you, guys. I will clear these results out of the way, and I, I'll just take this opportunity to remind all of the attendees uh, to put any questions that they have in the Q&A panel um, of the Zoom um, application. Bobby, right back to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, so our, for our next questions, um, this has come up a little bit in the conversation already, but when we think about some of small molecule therapies, we do hear this idea of undruggable targets. Why have some disease targets been considered undruggable, and can degrader technology be used to target these undruggable targets? Well, maybe I could. Maybe I could start. So, I think you know, uh, undruggable in my mind, you know, means that it hasn't been drugged yet, and then often means that we haven't had the right. Uh, chemical strategy. And as we expand out the chemical strategies to be, you know, covalent inhibitors or mechanism-based inhibitors, you know, gradually more and more classes of targets become uh, drugged. But as we mentioned earlier, most of those strategies really are based on, on ligand occupancy and inhibiting an enzymatic uh, activity. And so uh, the real, you know, one of the real attractive features here has already been, you know, very well demonstrated that you can degrade proteins that are essentially, you know, cavityless by having the small molecule degrader, you know, induce a interaction 
with an appropriate, uh, you know, ligase uh, complex. And so many things that by, you know, conventional drug ability measures are, are undruggable are in fact uh, highly degradable. And there are some examples shown, you know, on this slide, uh, these uh, zinc finger uh, transcription factors, for example, IKZF1 and 3, would have been considered uh, undruggable by other approaches. Yeah, and I think, so, so I think that's great, Nathaniel. And I think that's probably the most accurate uh, reflection of what most people think about, you know, the not yet drugged or the very difficult to drug, maybe undruggable is the, is the extreme example of that. I think there's another way to look at this too, and, and it does get back to traditional inhibitor approaches. Um, your ability to actually get a molecule that binds and engages at um, such high target occupancies required by some targets can be just out of reach to make sure that you have a molecule that binds tightly enough and you can get the exposure there long enough to make sure you have the pharmacological effect. I think one of the most profoundly important, another yet another factor in this space is that you can often, and we often do see, great um, disconnects between PK and the resulting uh, pharmacodynamics. And that is by removing the protein, particularly as you mentioned earlier in those sort of scaffolding proteins that uh, reside in larger complexes, by removing that target protein, you can actually disrupt large complexes that can take quite a while for the cells to recombine and rebuild. And that leads to, while the PK is there and the degrader is working, it's removing the target protein, the effects of that removal of the protein are often be quite profound and prolonged. And so you see quite distinct and long disconnects between PK and PD. And so I think it will take time to figure out what does this all mean and how does one um, factor that into um, to greater design and, um, and dosing in patients and so forth. But that I think is where the, uh, yet another aspect of going after difficult to drug or really poorly drugged proteins in the past could be leveraged by this, uh, by this approach fully. Yeah, I, I think those, those have been great summaries. And I, only one, one little thing to add is we're just scratching the surface, right? We're still we're thinking about what can't be drugged because we can't find ligands. But there are many, many other reasons why something has been resistant to, to any approaches so far. I mean, if you think about many hub scaffolding proteins that have a large number of multivalent interactions, there's no, there's no way you can make PPI inhibitors, but maybe taking them out by degradation would be a way of doing that. So I think there's a lot more to come. Um, and as the technology is out there, people are starting to think about how to apply it. And that's really going to fuel discovery over the, the years to come. Great. Yeah. So taking a step uh, in a, a slightly different direction, we've been talking a lot about this target focus, and that's one side of the bivalent recruitment. But on the other side, you're recruiting these E3 ligases. And is there, when, when designing a degrader, is there any benefit to recruiting one E3 ligase versus another, or are they all kind of the same? I would start here. I think it's it's too early to really tell um, in, at the highest level about selecting a specific E3 for a particular application. I will say that you know the, the precedent and it's um, and we've talked about it a lot, and that is in the image. Cerebron has proved to be a very effective, based on that clinical precedent for the last twenty years, um, a very effective E3 to handle and to do the job. It's it, it has. Um, known side effects that are related to the, the drugs that um, are, are out there, but it is ubiquitously expressed in all compartments of the cell and throughout the body. And so, and it seems to be very promiscuous to uh, E3 ligase as well. So I, I think Cerebron is certainly enough to drive the, the, um, the approach at this stage, um, but additionally, E3 ligases as they become well characterized and understood will certainly um, help benefit the area, I would argue. Yeah, and I think to add to this, there has to be one distinction made. Um, being an academic lab, we often really want the quickest way to get a chemical probe that's selective and active, not really caring too much what the ligase is we use. And so screening a bunch of ligase in almost like a sparse matrix approach there makes a lot of sense because often by just swapping the ligase, you get the desired selectivity profile you want. If you're really thinking about these as, as track discovery projects, there's certainly other components to be looked at, as you alluded to, which is, is it safe to put this into a human? And I think 
one caveat here is for many ligase, we don't even know what they do. So we don't know what perturbing them or, or messing with them would really do on a physiological level. Yeah, so at that level, I think Cerebron is, is probably the only one or, or one of the very few that has actually been tried and true in the clinic and shown to be leveraged in this way. So I think that does put Cerebron in a privileged spot currently. Yeah, and the other thing to add is just the you know, the nature of the small molecules that we have binding to these ligands uh, influences, you know, the design. And so the cerebellon based ligands are amongst the smallest, you know, versus for example, VHL, where they're more peptidic based uh, ligands. And so then if you make a protac molecule, there's a big advantage to having a small starting point as your ligase recruiter to control, you know, the overall properties of the, uh, of the compound. But obviously there's a lot of ligases um, uh, out there and, you know, some might be um, advantageous in terms of being, you know, more essential. It's already known in the clinic, you know, in cancer, you know, that one way to get, you know, resistance is to lose uh, expression of some component of the, of the complex, including just the E3. Uh, and so if you have a ligase that's more essential, you know, that resistance mechanism might be circumvented. And then the other opportunities around, you know, tissue specific uh, degradation, if you have uh, machinery that might be specific to uh, one cell type, so you don't have to degrade uh, throughout the um, organism. And that's actually a big challenge for degraders, is that the, the, the spectrum of targets that they degrade can be very different in different cell types and different uh, tissues, which means that the uh, toxicological assessment of these kind of compounds needs to be done very carefully. Great. So thinking about another component of these degrader molecules is this linker um, kind of in the middle of the target recruitment and the E3 ligase recruitment. Um, so when everything comes together in the ternary complex, how important is that stability of the ternary complex and what role does the linker play in that stability? Yes, I'll jump in here. I think I think it's important to think about these molecules, not as stabilizers, but as catalytic activators. And I think that's you know, really important to keep top of mind because um, while there are certainly cases and uh, where stabilizing that ternary complex goes hand in hand with an efficient ubiquitination downstream process, there is an equal number of examples uh, where uh, transitory interactions in that ternary complex and actually no, no frank stabilization so in, in cases where you have proteins which are really clearly um, anti-cooperative in their binding interactions are still competent um, for degradation. Um, what you need to do there is to be sure that the degrader is lining up all the other aspects of the catalytic cycle so that as soon as they do come together, the, the protein is then ubiquinated rapidly. So I think it's important to note that while the ternary complex is something to relatively easy to conceive and potentially even optimize around. It isn't, it's the first and obligate step, but it doesn't have to be stabilized or, um, and it can be quite transient in its, in its overall um, uh, population. Yeah, and I would, I would add to this, I think kind of summarizing in different words what Stu just said, there's a fundamental need for a ternary complex to be formed at some point because you gotta get the target close to your ligase to achieve ubiquitination of the target. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be stable. And I think the other thing we learned so far empirically from working with different ligases, different targets, it may be very different for the same target, but using a different ligase, or it may be very different for a different targets. So I think there's not a single parameter at this point that he can focus on and purely optimize for. Yeah, I think, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to add, I think, you know, complementarity, it's really, I think there's, it's, um, it's a sort of uh, perhaps getting a bit redundant here. It's really about making sure that less, less focus on is the protein itself truly com uh, complementary to your ligase that may or may not be helpful. It's really making sure that that ligase is capable and competent for turning that protein over. And, and uh, this, this, I think, is the one thing that is, um, requires a, a very open mind in the med chem approach and, and how you design uh, better degraders. It's, it's making sure that you're open-minded and seeing, I can follow the data that says um, 
that this molecule is capable of turning over this target protein, but not getting too rigid in your thinking about how best to optimize it, but let the data um, to show you the way rather than try to uh, impose sort of rigid constraints on, on how you think to optimize the system a priori. Great, so uh, the three of you are, are definitely experts in this space. So when you're thinking about which disease state or which protein might be good candidates for targeting by a degrader, uh, how do you choose that versus just targeting it for inhibition? I guess uh, I'll, I'll start on this one. Um, I would say that we, we take a very open mind and a very, and a very sober view uh, look, there's some phenomenal inhibitors out there. We, we, we respect those and, and appreciate uh, their benefits. And so not every target is best um, dealt with through degradation. I think, so we don't inherently apply degradation first and always as in when we're looking at targets. We ask questions um, that are uh, maybe different, maybe a, a bit deeper. We look to those cases where there's the strongest genetic knockout information for a target as our first priority. And because I think when you're looking at degradation, you're most closely replicating either um, RNA knockdown or even um, perhaps uh, similarly or better as a CRISPR knockout. So that's exactly what this uh, technology does. It does it faster and it does it in some ways in a more transient way, but you do get to the same end result of target is now removed from the cell. So I think when you're looking at prioritizing targets, we put a lot of stock in um, the, those uh, genetic screens that show uh, dependency on a target through knockdown or knockout um, as our priority for, and then look to see, are there inhibitors that already do the job for that target? Um, and so is there a, a case to be made that would be differentiated from that? So I'd say that's the kind of parameters we, we keep in mind when thinking about targets. I think one other consideration is the uh, protein resynthesis rate. So, you know, a lot of good degrader molecules uh, degrade the target, you know, very quickly, and then are th they themselves uh, quickly uh, metabolized. You know, if you have a degrader molecule with a very long half-life, uh, once it's, you know, finished chewing up its fast substrates, it can start degrading uh, weaker substrates, you know, more slowly. So in my mind, it's actually, you know, good to have a rapidly degraded target but then if the protein resynthesis rate is such that it comes right back, you know, there may not be a big advantage of a degrader. So having an un understanding of the intrinsic protein resynthesis rate is sort of a key part of the equation when you're trying to decide uh, how potent of a degrader that you need and what kind of exposure you need to maintain uh, target suppression. Yeah, and I think the one thing to add is probably there's certainly certain groups of targets that are not amenable, right? So if you have, for example, a transmembrane protein that has basically no cytosolic part, that might be a very hard one to go after. So I think keeping in mind what might be very hard to target for degradation just because of the biology um, is something to think about. Yeah, I think, you know, to date there's not been any examples that I'm aware of in, say, GPCRs or ion channels, and I think that that's the reason why it's very hard to find, uh, you know, cytosolic loops or binding sites for those types of proteins to allow your ligase to then tag it and, and mark it. So, uh, I think that's a very good point, Eric. Great. So we will uh, take a, another quick pause from the questions. Um, and before we do, I do want to remind the audience that if you have any questions for our panelists, use the Q and A button in the Zoom window. Um, and with that, we do have a second poll the audience question. And I'll hand that back to Charlie. All right, attendees, I'm going to launch a poll for you here. Please let us know what challenges uh, must be overcome or would you expect must be overcome during the development of degraders. You can choose uh, uh, a multiple choice here for these questions. Um, do you think the challenges are more along the lines of identifying targets? Uh, minimizing compound size, developing new pipelines, translating the work in animal model, models, or determining optimal treatment doses. Oh, they're running neck and neck here, guys. I tell you, people are seeing all kinds of challenges coming through. 
seems to have slowed down just a bit. So I will end this polling in three, two, one. All right, let's share these results. As you can see, the audience chose identifying targets that would most benefit from degradation as the uh, top challenge that must be over challenge that must be overcome. 56%. Um, the translating work in animal models to human studies at 51% being a close second. Uh, any thoughts or comments on those results? Do the did the audience nail it, guys? Yeah, no, I think you can make a compelling uh, argument for you know, any of these points. And I think just picking up on one we haven't talked about as much about translating from animal models into uh, humans. Uh, this is a really key consideration for degraders because uh, if there's a species difference in the protein-protein interface that you're creating between the target and the ligase, you can see very different efficiencies of, uh, of degradation. So you've really got to uh, try to match your degradation profile between your efficacy, your animal study, and hopefully uh, humans uh, to be able to make the, the you know, right uh, predictions. And there's been some you know, beautiful work done trying to understand, for example, what differences there are between mouse and human cerebellon uh, such that you can get the right uh, degradation results. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, this can also be uh, tissue specific. So you might have you know, one degradation profile that looks clean, but then in, in neurons, you see something, you know, quite, uh, quite different. And I think, you know, a lot of people for that reason, you know, view this primarily as a oncology drug development strategy, where you might be able to tolerate more risks in terms of safety than for other, uh, you know, indications. Doesn't mean degraders aren't going to be applicable outside of, of cancer, but I really do think there's going to be a lot of, you know, potential surprises and the thalidomide story should be, you know, cautioned to, to everybody. Excellent. All right. Thank you. I will stop sharing the polling results. And Bobby, you are back on. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, so thinking about these challenges, um, you know, this poll question, when we think about the pipeline uh, of drug discovery, how does that change for a ProTac versus an inhibitor or does it change at all? Yeah, I, I guess I don't think it changes fundamentally. The process remains the same, um, but I do think it's not in a space that you can take lightly. Um, this is, uh, it, I think it's, as, as Nathaniel highlighted when we were talking at the earlier poll, there are a lot of ways to use degradation. One of them is to find tool compounds to, to sort of prove or expand on biology insights. I think that's relatively straightforward with this technology. I think to be able to get molecules that are capable of being a very effective tool compounds is generally straightforward using standard medicinal chemistry uh, approaches. Um, and then there's even tools that, that make that uh, even easier through the various uh, A tag, D tag systems. Um, on the other hand, to make these into drugs, that is um, a challenging process. And it does take real deep commitment from a, an organization to say, we're gonna get into this, we're gonna think differently, we're gonna um, think more empirically than, uh, than, than maybe uh, traditional inhibitor processes uh, or programs may require. So I'd say that the, the, the most important thing to keep in mind is, is a commitment to, the, to, to developing these and keeping an open mind so that you can advance molecules in to see what they do rather than prejudge them uh, on their uh, two-dimensional merits. Yeah, I think that was a good summary. I, I would also say there is not something that's inherently different in setting up a drug discovery pipeline. You need to have the right experiments in place. You need to understand what you want, and then you need to com commit to getting there. And comparing it to inhibitors and things are different if you compare it to other modalities. There are certain things that are easy and there are certain things that are more difficult, just to pick on one example. It is fairly straightforward for a degrader to tell in an unbiased way, what it's degrading in the cell line because the readout can be proteomics and you're essentially looking out, out for proteins that drop out. That can be a fundamental challenge for inhibitors to understand what really is the off-target profile. So, but there are other things that are then more complicated. So I think it's really understanding what you're trying to do and build the right systems that allow you to drive the pharmacology you want. 
And there are, of course, you know, many uniquely enabling assays to look at ubiquitilation, ternary complex formation, uh, cell penetration, efficient, you know, protein degradation than are different than your standard inhibitor uh, development. So that provides some barrier to the field. But, you know, best practices in all those categories are rapidly being established. The vendors are beginning to have these uh, assays. So that barrier to entry, I think, is gradually uh, going down to people coming into this field. Yeah, and thinking more about current uh, inhibition molecules, one challenge we see is that small mutations in these active sites or these binding pockets can drastically change the drug ability of a target um, for these inhibitor molecules. How can degraders overcome this challenge or, or do they do, uh, overcome the challenge? I think planning a provocative answer would be to say, we don't, at this point really we don't know, and they may not, right? They may not be intrinsically less prone to resistance. I think we have to, in the end, wait and see what's happening in the clinic. On the flip side, I think the one thing we can say is the resistance mechanisms are going to be fairly orthogonal to what we see with traditional active site targeted inhibitors. And so that may create very unique opportunities from a clinical point of view where resistance emerges, but you have a second hit at the same target. So I think it's really early days for this to, to fully play out, but there could be arguments played in both directions right now. Yeah, I think that that's, that's you know, very sage. I would say I fully anticipate there will be resistance mechanisms. I don't know what they will be, but uh, I think whenever you put a disease state under pressure, um, nature will find a way as, as a provocative saying goes. I do think it will be orthogonal to traditional uh, approaches um, because it is fundamentally different. Um, so I think it's about, you know, at the, at the first steps, we're going to learn a lot. I think it's best to place um, uh, degraders in the places of most highest unmet medical needs. So you can see the benefit clearly should resistance arise. There's, um, it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, it may be inevitable, but clearly has, an, has made a mark before that does happen. I think we see that certainly in cases of oncology. Um, but I, I think it would be uh, foolish to say that this new approach, as exciting as it is, will be devoid of any kind of resistance profile. Um, there are some that would say that's actually proof of mechanism, and they're looking forward to seeing that data. I'm not that bullish on the resistance profile, but I do see people have different views on all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think so, some things are, are quite, you know, predictable, also based on, uh, on data. You know, we do expect to see mutations in the protein-protein uh, interface, like you see between mouse and, and human, that can cause a difference in efficiency of degradation. Uh, the expression of the ligase uh, can go down. That can be silenced by any, any number of epigenetic or other uh, mechanisms. But as both Stu and Eric pointed out, you know, active site mutations, you know, which can reduce ligand occupancy by a, a large fold for a classical inhibitor may not give full resistance to a degrader that can get away with a lower level of occupancy. So we do expect to have that complementarity towards a, um, a known inhibitor. And then for highly validated targets, you know, there is the attractive strategy that you have your classical orthosteric inhibitor, but then also on board, you have the, uh, the degrader. And so you're going after the target by two orthogonal mechanisms. Uh, as we know from, you know, antiviral therapy, that can be a great way to, you know, circumvent resistance by having multiple strategies working uh, simultaneously. And so I expect in the future we'll see some things like that be deployed. Awesome. Uh, so we're kind of reaching towards the end of our time. This, I think, will be the last question from me, but we spent the past 40, 45 minutes talking about the great future of degraders. Um, and, and how, how the technology is going. So should all new research now focus on degraders? No, no, of course not. There's actually, there's, a, there's actually probably um, more effort than there, than there needs to be. So uh, as normal technology bubbles, the, you know, the pendulum of disillusionment is coming and we'd rather it swing uh, not, not, too, uh, not too quickly. Um, so we definitely shouldn't, you know, shouldn't over, uh, over promise. And there's some things that are just going to have to be learned uh, iteratively, and that, and that will take some uh, time. But, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, risk about, you know, whether these can actually be drugs was accidentally already, you know, already proven. So 
I, I don't think the, there, there's, there can't be any naysayers that say it's never going to work. It's just a question of, you know, how well can it work and how systematically can we um, make it work in the future? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's tremendous excitement here, but there's a, there's, there is, it's another plank in uh, the drug uh, armamentarium and it's going to sit uh, in time in a, in a privileged spot alongside with all the other approaches that people are, are using now. We're just developing it now. So I think it is uh, go forward with, with, with great excitement, but, uh, but, but also have an objective view on, on where it's best placed is the way we look at this. Yeah, totally agree. Great. So with that, I think we can open it up to audience questions. I hate to cut things short with the panelists, but we've been getting a ton of great questions in um, and Charlie's been monitoring those. So I'll throw it back to Charlie to continue this conversation with audience questions. Yeah. All right, panelists. So uh, we've had tons of great questions and, and uh, we're collecting them attendees. So if we don't get to them, uh, please forgive us. I, I don't think there's any way we could get to all of them. Um, so um, it, there was some early interest in knowing um, how important is selectivity of an inhibitor for which the degrader is attached. Suppose the compound inhibits two or three targets. Uh, how important is that information uh, in this, uh, designing these? So it, 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 it's useful, but it's actually been very surprising. So there's many examples of very promiscuous inhibitors that when they're used as a warhead for a degrader become a very selective degrader because, you know, many things have to happen correctly in terms of engagement and turner complex formation for the degrader to, uh, to work. So in my mind, the, the promiscuity of the initial ligand is actually not so important. Yeah, and I, I would add to this, when you, when you think about it for a second, sometimes as small as a methyl can make a big difference if, in, for example, an ATP site-directed inhibitor. And so we have to think of these molecules not so much as the sum of A, B, C, but really it's the molecule that binds to a complex of the target and the ligase. And so some of the differences on either side or the linker can really make a huge difference on, on overall selectivity. Completely agree. And I think just to expand on that point from both Nathaniel and Eric, um, the SAR, one of the reasons it becomes challenging um, in terms of the drug discovery process is we were talking about larger molecules typically and, and modifications throughout the entire molecule have a profound effect on their overall degradation potency and um, selectivity, but I would certainly echo Nathaniel's perspective. It's our experience as well that we tend to get much more selectivity um, than one might anticipate from straight binding. So I would say that's the least uh, concerning element in terms of uh, the drug discovery component that I, I consider at this stage. Perfect, thank you. So uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, um, we've had um, uh, several questions uh, around uh, the um, applicability and use of traditional ADME assays, such as cell permeability assays, um, with respect to um, degraders uh, as compared, of course, to typical small molecules. Uh, are these ADME assays still going to be applicable in the degrader space? And then kind of going beyond that, beyond the ADME assays, which uh, are gonna be the most interesting phenotypic PROTAC assays um, out there as we move forward. So I, I can jump in on this one. Uh, I'll be quite clear. We found that those traditional, particularly the permeability assays to be uh, not helpful, I guess is what I would argue, not informative. We have plenty of examples of compounds that do not perform well in those assays and yet show um, good to excellent bio oral bioavailability and, and clearly um, excellent cellular activity. So they get into cells, they can be um, uh, highly permeable, and, and we've, we've not found that those assays to be um, all that predictive. In some projects they do, but um, across the whole, uh, we've, we've uh, I found that our, our investments in those have been uh, largely uh, not informative. And, and to, to the, the latter question that you had, Charlie, we found more often than not um, that the in vitro side of the ADME process to be um, helpful possibly in retrospect, but nothing beats going in vivo with compounds which are compelling. And we have been um, found that an empirical approach in vivo PK has been the most fruitful 
uh, way of understanding what a molecule really can do. And, and um, so that's a point where I'd say uh, using traditional medicinal chemistry approaches could actually slow you down significantly in the space. Nice, thank you. That kind of a follow on or, or you know, maybe it's already that's the answer. Um, uh, there was a, a medicinal chemist in the room uh, who was uh, interested in, in understanding why and, and how uh, much importance it is to take the paradigm shift from inhibitor designing uh, over to, to protax and um, just kind of exploring a little bit more on the inhibitor approach and uh, whether it'll be completely replaced by the protax or is it still you know having good potential um, for some of the problems faced um, I, I know Stu earlier you, you talked about having an open mind and and moving beyond these traditional uh, inhibitor approaches um, uh, so there was a, a bit more uh, flavor requested there from a, a medicinal chemist standpoint in the room any additional thoughts or did yeah you... I'll, I'll I think I think you know it, it, it's um, maybe I'll, I'll just echo again what I said I think it does come down to target choice and where what options you have in front of you. If it's clear that from a, a given target that an inhibitor approach um, affords you know, ready access to ligands which are optimizable and then you can get the PK to get the pharmacology done, um, that's straightforward, well understood, and I think it can be extremely efficient. And taking out a new modality where you have some of these other concerns that Nathaniel and, and Eric have raised and I have as well around, um, you know, uh, potentially safety uh, risks and so forth, maybe an inhibitor approach is the best way forward. However, if you have selectivity concerns or you see strong genetic um, uh, evidence and it's difficult to find a ligand binding site where you're going to be able to get a sufficient potency and occupancy to drive the effect, I think those are ideally suited for the degrader approach. So um, I, I, there is no right or wrong answer to this. Certainly, I don't see degraders overtaking the drug discovery uh, landscape. I see them fitting in as a complementary tool in the next 20 years. And I just think there's tremendous excitement because we're in it now, but I don't see it um, dominating one field over another. I think it's, uh, it's like almost any other um, more mature area of drug discovery. Uh, there's a difference between high throughput screening and fragment-based screening and virtual screening. All are powerful, but they have their various places in the, in the drug discovery uh, continuum. Totally agree. <laughs> Excellent. So th there's a specific question on E3 ligases and kind of the current work being done. Um, how many of these E3 ligases can currently be targeted? And what are the key challenges to finding binders to other E3 ligases? Uh, and also speaking to the limitations of certain uh, of these complexes that exist only in certain tissues so that a degrader would have to work in that tissue before it's disease relevant. And really kind of just having already identified a protein, what are the practical steps in designing a protac? Which linker or E3 ligase would you start with? What's the best approaches for optimization of this degrader process? I think, I mean, speaking just a little bit from the ligase side, there are ligands available for about probably a handful I think the much more fundamental problem at this point is that we really don't know a priori which is a good ligase and which is not a good ligase to work with. And there's been some work that's been done, but there are also examples. People made good ligands, but we didn't get any, any, any proper degradation of a target. And I think there's a lot that we don't understand from a biology point of view, what happens between this step that we control, which is the recruitment of the target, physical recruitment of the target to the ligase, and the ultimate outcome, which is degradation by the proteasome. And there are certain ligases we know that travel with associated dubs, and they may keep them very tightly under check unless a certain biological cue disrupts this interaction. It could completely counteract your desired outcome. So I know that's not really an answer, but I think it just highlights some, some of the complexities we, we have. And so we've been taking the approach that anything where we have data, and that's a handful of ligands really at this point that they could potentially work is something we, we invested on. Um, and otherwise, try to understand the biology. Ligands that are known to have multiple substrates and act fast and, and processively on those 
respect to degradation might be the better, better ones to pick. I don't think there's a fundamental problem from a ligand discovery perspective. It's really much more how do you de-risk before you start such a campaign. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, interesting question. Um, we're seeing a lot of talk now about AI and modeling and predictive um, technologies out there. So um, a question came in, how reliable are these predictive computational models in predicting protect efficiency? Um, and are they you know, more reliable for E3 ligase interface due to the um, uh, complex understanding of the structure and activity? Uh, are you seeing computational uh, predictive modeling working? I mean, maybe I can take this on too because we've, we've done quite a bit of work in this space. Um, there, there, I think at this point, one, one fundamental answer is there's not enough data. Um, the data sets we have, especially the published data sets, are really just not big enough. From, from the modeling, the, the complex formation point of view, I think there's really great progress that's been made and it's done on multiple levels and putting these together is going to get us closer to be able to do this in a reasonable amount of time. I think the other really difficult question is to, to, to answer whether there are certain targets that are just intrinsically resistant to degradation and what are some of the biological parameters that would allow us to predict those. And I, I think that's where we really just need more data. And so especially negative data is really helpful in driving, driving this development. Yeah, I don't have much more to add, although I, it's funny, we just had a conversation uh, this morning on this point. I think um, you know, the ability to really leverage AI and those sort of approaches does rely on your basis training set. And I, I think by and large, those sets are still emerging now, and it's, it's, um, I'm not saying it can't be done. I just think that it's going to be challenging at this point for all the reasons that Eric just highlighted. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So I think we pretty much only have time for one more question. And uh, it's, we do these uh, webinars, as, as uh, Dr. Thorne mentioned, uh, uh, quarterly. And it's always interesting because there's always questions um, that are requiring our panelists to break out their crystal ball and predict and see into the future. So guys, if you, if you have your, your crystal balls handy, go ahead and dig them out of your desk because uh, this is one of those questions. So the, the concept of uh, bivalent degraders has been worked on for years by many researchers, uh, but so far there are two in the clinic, AR and ER. So obviously properties are a challenge. Um, are these uh, two that are already out there, are they just more amenable to corresponding degraders staying in drug-like space, or do you think this is just a matter of time and then we're going to see a surge of these uh, uh, degraders in the near future? So um, there you go, crystal ball time. What do you think? Uh, I'm very confident we're going to see lots of degraders in the pipeline going forward. I, I credit our Venus with advancing the, the first two of that type. Um, we give credits to them. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a real testament to their uh, initial uh, entry into the field, and, and they were to get to the clinic first. But I, I have no doubt that there's going to be um, many more uh, heterobifunctional degraders and glues entering the clinic going forward. Right, you know, it comes down to your risk profile. So, you know, AR and, and ER, we already had experience with, you know, ligands and even ligands that induced, you know, degradation. So really the, the risk is on the new molecule and problems with that, you know, new molecule. And then as we go forward, people will take risks both on the target, the degradation of the target and on the, on the molecule. And um, we just, you know, we, we hope that some of these early Examples are, are uh, you know, successful because that'll have, you know, a big influence on future investment in the field. Yeah, I agree with all that was said. All right. I think that's it, Bobby. Back to you. All right. Great. Thank you to the audience and thank you to the panelists again. Um, we did ask the panelists a lot of questions, so I do want to give you one last chance to leave the audience with one piece of advice or take home from today's webinar. Um, if you have one thing that people should leave thinking about, um, and we can start with uh, you, Stu, maybe if you have the one take, take away from this webinar. Yeah, it's, it's just that it's a super exciting field and um, 
But if you get into this, make sure you're committed to it. I think there's a, there's a number of pitfalls that will, like any other new emerging technology, may cause you to, to, to question your resolve. But uh, I, I feel it's worth it. So, um, so get into it, and, but, but get into it with both feet. Great. Nathaniel, do you have something for us? Yeah, no, I, I think really, you know, make sure the, the degradation part of it is, is useful for the, the question and not because it's the new and, and trendy thing to do. There's clearly going to be a lot of challenges and resistance to that area, you know, going forward in terms of development and toxicology and problems. So I think you really have to, you know, decide, especially if you're in a pharmaceutical organization, you know, if the organization is really ready to uh, accept that, you know, before investing a lot of effort on the research side in something that, you know, ultimately management is not going to support. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Eric? Yeah, stay open-minded. There's a lot more cool stuff small molecules can do beyond degradation. Great. So we have reached the end of our time. Thank you again, Stu, Eric, and Nathaniel for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for your great questions. I do encourage everyone to pay close attention to the degraders as they start to go through clinical trials. It is a really exciting time. And these first few will be a great indicator of where the technology will go um, and how the landscape may change. So thank you again, everyone. And we look forward to collaborating. Thank you. Thank you.